As you'll see today, humans have been very ingenious when it comes to making people suffer. We've ripped out ribs for decoration and impaled people on perennial plants, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. On the face of it, we aren't really a very nice species at times, and if you don't agree with us, by the end of the show, we'll happily take that back. Number 10. Molten Gold Let's start with a symbolic kind of punishment fit for a thief. Pouring molten gold down someone's throat sounds like something you'd see on TV. You might have watched the episode in Game of Thrones when something like that happened, although in that case the poor victim was given a golden crown, fit for a king no less. Did such a thing happen in real life? As you'll see today, in all its bloody glory, there's no end to the depths that humans will sink to. So yes, of course, it is possible that some people throughout history died after someone smelted a load of gold and poured it down their throat. We rather like the story of Valerian, who was the Roman emperor from 253 to 260 AD. By all accounts, he was not a very nice guy, often persecuting Christians by taking everything they had and banishing them from Rome. When the mood took him, he also had them executed. But then he met his downfall after the Battle of Edessa in the year 260. He lost and subsequently became a prisoner of war to the Persian king, Shapur I. Shapur I was also a guy that didn't hold back when it came to punishing people. Once he had Valerian in captivity, for a while he just concentrated on humiliating him, using him at times as a footstool which he used to get on his horse. Valerian was a bit upset about this, as you can understand, and he offered Shapur a tempting ransom for his release. Shapur's response was, eh, nah. Historians sometimes disagree as to what happened next, and one account has him being flayed alive and his skin then stuffed with straw so he could be used as a trophy. But there's a better story, and it's said that Shapur had some gold melted down so the stuff could be poured down Valerian's throat. While this would definitely be a painful kind of death, the good news for its victims is that the death is almost instant. You don't swallow the stuff and think, ow, that's hot. Rather, your organs are immediately ruptured and you die due to pulmonary dysfunction and shock. The gold would take about 10 seconds to congeal, so even if you somehow lasted that long, your airways would be blocked. That's what might happen to the ever-greedy Marcus Licinius Crassus, the richest man in Rome who was famous for being part of that first triumvirate with the great Julius Caesar and the warmongering man we now call Pompey the Great. Crassus, not the best of the three when it came to war, lost a battle with the Parthians, and because he was so greedy, they gave him the molten gold treatment. But we can't talk about his punishment without mentioning the Spanish conquistadors who, as you know, went over to South America and back in the day, stealing as much gold as they could. If anyone deserved the molten gold death, it was those guys. There's a great story published in the National Library of Medicine that discusses the death of a Spanish governor in Ecuador back in 1599. The natives of the Hivaro tribe had had enough of this guy hitting them with high taxes, so they kidnapped him and killed him by making him drink molten gold. It was this story that inspired a bunch of Dutch scientists to see what would happen if someone actually did that, but unfortunately they couldn't get any humans to volunteer for the experiment. Instead they used a cow, a dead cow, and indeed they said the cause of death would have been from ruptured organs. As we said, it would have been over very quickly, but this next death would have been slow and very, very painful. Number 9. The Spiked Hair As you probably heard, torture was very a la mode in Europe during the Middle Ages. Everyone got up to it, either as a form of getting a person to spill the beans, often where there were no beans to spill, or as a means of frightening people so they'd think twice about committing the same kind of crime. Usually the punishments were performed in public squares on market days. They were big events, rather like a heavyweight boxing match in today's times. Historians say people would travel for miles not just to see some blood being spilled, but also to sell their wares. Sometimes the event was the punishment of a witch, which happened to thousands of women back then. The condemned woman would be taken from town to town over a period of weeks. As we said, these events were big money spinners. One of the punishments was called the spiked hair. It basically involved a tool that looks similar to those devices that makes little holes in your lawn. The reason it got the name spiked hair is that when the torturer was done, the victim would look a bit like a hare that's about to be roasted. The torture was said to have been quite popular in Germany, at least until Frederick the Great banned it in 1740. If you visit the museums there today, you'll find a few of the rollers still in existence. With enough rolling up and down someone's back, people would admit to almost anything. Ouch, 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 okay, I turned my husband into a cat. Something like that. It's not mentioned in too many stories, just likely because in terms of punishment, this one was mostly used on regular folks, not powerful people or outright maniacs. In the 1767 dictionary written by a German guy named Johann Theodor Jablonski, he described it like this. It's a roller with small pointed pegs stuck around it. This is placed under the patient's back when he's stretched out on the bench and pulled back and forth. It may not have caused instant death like having gold forced down your throat, but it did tear a person's flesh to pieces. Not only would it have been very painful, but at the time and after, the victim would have likely have died from an infection. Now let's head over to China, where slow deaths were all the rage. Number 8. The Kang 
This punishment was really common, although it didn't always end in death. It doesn't sound too bad at first though. Imagine you had committed a transgression. The authorities wanted to make an example out of you and leave you with a mark of shame, something which was not unusual in the past. The Europeans would often use branding, so a thief would get a T branded on his face. The Chinese had the Kang, right up until the 20th century too. It was a wooden board fastened around someone's neck, usually with the crime they committed written onto the board. So when they went into public, they couldn't exactly blend into the crowd. If their crime wasn't a very severe one, they might have only worn the Kang for a day or two. And if people felt a bit sorry for them, they might have given them water or food. Remember that the board was so big a person couldn't get their hands to their mouth. If people didn't bother helping, they slowly died in shame, and this was not uncommon. There was an even worse punishment though, kind of connected to the king. It happened to Chinese rebels in the year 1900. They were put inside a box with their neck fastened to some wood while they balanced on pegs. Each day the pegs were lowered a bit, so they died slowly from hanging. As you'll now see, for China that was kind of tame. Number 7. The Waste Chop Back when we were little, many of us used to love watching magic tricks, especially the ones where people were cut in half, or at least you were supposed to think they were. But what would happen if that wasn't a magic trick, but a torture method instead? Waste chopping first became a thing in China during the Chao Dynasty, from 1046 BC to 256 BC. Though there are a lot of stories of it happening right up until the 18th century, they even had a word for it, John. It was supposed to be very slow and painful, although Chinese historians tell us that sometimes the victim was able to pay the executioner to either stab them somewhere fatal first, or at least pay to buy some kind of pain relief. The more cash you had, the less painful being tortured was. If the procedure started at the waist, as it usually did, it could go on for a long time before the person was dead. In fact, there's a story about an education administrator named Yu Hong Tu who in 1734 went to the chopping block for giving the answers away to exam questions. The executioner took his time, and so Hong Tu was able to use his blood to wipe the words miserable, cruel, and awful on the floor. Historians say that during this era sawing someone in half replaced cooking someone to death as a form of punishment. We're not quite sure which one we'd prefer. Before some of you folks start criticizing the Chinese, you might want to know that the Europeans were also into sawing people in two, as were the people in the Middle East, Asia, and North Africa. Let's face it, it doesn't take a genius to know that this punishment would be frighteningly painful. There were two ways of doing it. One was to saw across the middle of the body, but we think the horizontal sawing style would have been much worse. Not that we'd like to have to choose. The ever-paranoid Roman Emperor Caligula had a thing for sawing folks, with some sources saying he did it even to members of his own family. The French did a bit of sawing when Napoleon was doing his thing, and there's some evidence that the Serbians did it to the Hungarians in the year 1850. The victims were men, women, and children, and it happened just after the Hungarian Revolution. There are instances of it happening pretty much all over the world. So as disgusting and far-fetched as you might think it is, it definitely happened, and it did so many times. The most recent cases involved Cambodia's Khmer Rouge. According to witnesses whose testimonies were heard when the Khmer Rouge went on trial, sometimes the victim would be tied between two poles and sawed in two. The person's organs were then used to decorate nearby trees. If you know anything about the utter evil of this regime, you'll know this kind of thing was par for the course. Alright, now for something we know you've all thought about a time or another. Number 6. The Pit of Snakes while sawing someone in half does make a bit of sense as it's cheap, convenient, and effective, you could easily believe that death in a pit of snakes didn't just happen. We mean, would a king or a leader really go out of his way to collect a bunch of snakes and keep them in a pit waiting for the time when he could throw a guy in? We found one website which said it was very common, but we reckon that's not exactly true. It wasn't common at all, and if it did happen, it only happened where the Vikings were plundering their way around Europe. Inscriptions of various objects say it occurred, but it's not always easy to separate truth from legend. In one Viking tale, Ragnar was captured by King Ayala, the guy that ruled over Northumbria in northern England. In another story, it was the other way around and Ayala was given a gruesome punishment we'll talk about later, but let's stick with Ayala winning and the Vikings losing. In this particular legend, written in the 14th century, has Ragnar squirming around in a snake pit. The writers of the tale have him saying, Fixed is the viper's harm, within my heart his mansion warm. In the recesses of my breast, the writhing snake hath formed his nest. Guess he had time to write some poetry. As it was, the vipers in the pit could be true. There are around 200 subspecies of vipers, and they're found all over the planet. The rattlesnake is a viper, as is the cottonmouth, as is the pit viper, and they're not all the kind of animals you'd want to share a pit with. If you did, they'd bite you, and if no one helped you, you'd die a slow death. We don't know what kind of snakes England had back then, but the country has venomous adders, a kind of viper, right now and they haven't killed anyone for 20 years, but we imagine if Mr. Ragnar was thrown into a pit of them, he would have eventually died. 
he would have become feverish, and because the hemotoxic venom had gotten into his blood cells and caused hemorrhaging, he might have started bleeding from the mouth. If the English had such a thing as a death certificate in those days, it would have said cause of death, extensive internal bleeding. We'll come back to the Vikings and arguably their most gruesome punishment, but let's stay with the evil English for now. Number 5. The Gibbet so picture this, it's the 1700s and you're just a regular guy living in a bustling city, London. You decide to go out for a walk with your wife and your 12-year-old kid, and as you stroll along the pathway next to the River Thames, occasionally praising the summer warmth and lush green views, a disgusting smell suddenly hits you. You walk on only for your kid to say, look daddy, look up there! As you get closer to what your kid is looking at, you see a man in a cage hanging from a tree. Ravens are pecking his eyes out, his flesh is blackened by decomposition, and what you're looking at is a former criminal. He's inside a gibbet. Back then, you could find such things all over London, often at crossroads so they got the most exposure. They were a warning to people and quite normal, even though it seems incredibly grim to us now. Pirates and smugglers were often the ones in the gibbet. Usually, they'd be hanged first. For the hanging, thousands of people would often turn up. They were huge events, sometimes family events. In the gibbets, the rotting flesh and stink of putrefaction were obscene. And not surprisingly, people would often complain that those gibbets were too close to their homes. They also sometimes scared little kids. But under the Murder Act of 1751, the British government said the people needed to be terrorized so they wouldn't think about committing crimes themselves. Rather than help the poor to prevent the spread of crime, they ignored poverty and upped the ante when it came to punishment. Hardliners still call for this kind of thing today. When a Mr. Swan was hung up in a gibbet, so-called gentlemen complained of the grim view from their houses. The authorities moved him to Buckets Hill, where the poor folks lived. Mr. Swan stayed there until the smaller bones fell out of the device. When the smugglers, who named themselves the Hawkehurst Gang, were arrested, some were transported to penal colonies, but around 14 were hanged and strung up in gibbets. As you can imagine, making the cages wasn't easy. We found some documents that the blacksmith named Richard Goodman was paid £17.14 14 for making a gibbet. It's almost $7,000 in today's money. In another document, the authorities wrote about one condemned man saying his head was shaved and tarred to preserve it from the action of the weather and the cap in which he had suffered was drawn over his face. On Saturday afternoon, his body, attired as at the time of his execution, having been firmly fixed in the irons necessary to keep the limbs together, was carried to the place of its intended suspension. Women weren't usually gibbeted, not because they didn't commit crimes, but because it was seen as rude to have a woman high up, where people might catch a glimpse of her rotting private parts. A flash of dirty panties was deemed to be more impolite back then than putting a rotting corpse in a cage for the kids to see. Go figure. You might be thinking, well, it's not as if they died in the gibbet. But in the Middle Ages, the authorities would sometimes hang a person up there alive and let the elements take care of them. Now that's a terrible death if there ever was one. But this is arguably worse. Number 4. The Judas Cradle In Europe in the Middle Ages, the authorities had all kinds of terrifying torture devices. Some were never used, such as the Iron Maiden, a coffin with spikes in it, and it's debatable if others were. The artifacts exist, but historians are sometimes unsure if the authorities built them just so they could show them off to the public. So maybe things such as the head crusher didn't really get used. Hard to say. You can find websites saying it did, but when you research a bit more, it's difficult to find real-life cases that were written about back then. As we said though, the artifacts exist, and also we wouldn't put it past those Middle Ages folks. This brings us to our favorite device that may or may not have been used, the Judas Cradle. It was basically a sharp pyramid stuck to the top of a chair. The person who was being interrogated would be forced to sit on the point, which we imagine would be slightly uncomfortable. But if the person wasn't talking, they'd have weights connected to their legs. The pyramid was also greased, allowing the weights to do much more damage. After a while, the internal injuries caused by the device became catastrophic. It was a horrible way to die. Today, there are plenty of these devices in museums all over Europe, and there is no shortage of sketches of people being tortured on such chairs. Some sources say they were involved in the 16th century in Spain as a means of getting people to confess during the Inquisitions, but we're not sure that's true. The Spanish had laws about torture, and they usually kept a really good record of what went down during interrogations. Nothing in those records talk about a Judas chair. If they did use it, the outcome was never good for the victim. They'd have been split and maimed, and even if they did survive, they more than likely would die from an infection. In conclusion, since people back then were ripped in pieces, boiled alive, or had their skin peeled off, all backed up by plenty of evidence, we're going to say the Judas chair may well have been used on more than a few occasions. Let's now get to a modern torture method that we are 100% sure led to many people's demise. Number 3. Tiger Cage during the Vietnam War, some U.S. politicians went to South Vietnam to see what the Vietnamese on their side were doing to their prisoners. Photographs weren't ever supposed to get back to the U.S. public, but they did, 
and they revealed that lots of prisoners were kept in tiger cages. Assisting the congressman that day was a guy named Don Lucci, and throughout his later life he talked about torture and the fact that the Americans didn't just turn a blind eye to it but actually spent a ton of money on contracts to make tiger cages, American-made tiger cages. Once the victims were thrown down into the cages, the hot sun would shine on them all day long. Their captors would throw lime on them just to make them itch and feel really uncomfortable. Sometimes they were beaten first. Some of them, merely student activists, died down there or were crippled during the beatings. Even a Buddhist monk died in a tiger cage. This wasn't a good look for the US. In 1970, the New York Times ran the headline, Saigon is investigating tiger cage cells at prison. Thousands of people said the report were tortured this way. The cages weren't all the same either, with some of them looking like coffins, big enough for only one person. One of the victims of these cages later said they put us in the tiger cages and when I came to my senses I thought I fell into hell because the cage was the shape of a coffin. This could lead to a slow and horrible death. The bloodied person would just lay there all day in his or her cage under the sun. Ants and sometimes snakes and centipedes could get in there with them. A Vietnamese museum later said thousands of prisoners died in the prison because they couldn't stand the tortures. This particular prison was built with American money and influenced by the CIA. As Mr. Luce said, the U.S. paid the salaries of the torturers, taught them new methods, and turned suspects over to the police. After telling everyone about what was really going on, he had to get out of Vietnam for fear of his life. That straw that broke the camel's back was waking up one day to find someone had put a deadly two-step snake in his bed. So yeah, torture isn't just from the Middle Ages and ancient times. This one is also modern, but it belongs to another age, and it's frankly disgusting. Number 2. Bamboo Torture in the 19th century, when the British were helping the Siamese, or Thai, during the Siamese invasion of Kedah, a British Navy admiral and explorer named Sherard Osborne was present. He wrote down some of the things that he saw and turned them into a book that critics now say is culturally important. That's because not many Western people were writing books about Southeast Asia back in those days. Osborne talked about one of the most macabre things he'd ever seen in his life. It involved some Siamese soldiers, some Malay victims, bamboo shoots, and what he referred to as formidable lances. He said he'd seen the natives cook people to death, but what they did with a shoot of bamboo was nothing short of evil. In his own words, talking about the bamboo, he explained its lance-like point should enter his body and bring on mortification and death by piercing the intestines. In short, a slow mode of impaling. That's right, this guy was forced to sit on a bamboo shoot and the shoot grew through his butthole and headed toward his intestines. This created possibly the slowest, scariest, and most painful way to die. It's mentioned by another Brit from back then who talked about it in his book Journey Across the Peninsula of India from Madras to Bombay. Yeah, the Indians got down with bamboo torture too, as did the Chinese, but it's the Japanese who did it last, or supposedly did, when they made their shoots grow through the captives' butts during World War II. First of all, maybe some of you are thinking, no way that could work. Actually, it could. Bamboo is super tough. That's why so many Asian countries still use it for scaffolding. It also grows extremely fast at about 36 inches, just over 91 centimeters a day. So as long as they could fasten the guy down, the bamboo could certainly poke through his backside and enter his insides quite quickly. Mythbusters once did a show on it and concluded it would have worked. But what about the Japanese army? If you know what they did in their dreaded Unit 731 camps, you could quite easily believe they'd have some fun with bamboo. Indeed, one book we found said great pain was inflicted on prisoners by tying them with their anus on the top of young bamboo shoots, which would pierce them as the shoots grew every day. Some historians have questioned if this actually occurred, but as you've heard, quite a few people have talked about it. In fact, the BBC once wrote, tales were told by surviving prisoners and soldiers who found the mutilated bodies of their lost comrades, how the Japanese placed bamboo shoots under the tied-down Allied prisoner. This is the biggest ouch torture we reckon you can get. This next one's more of an ah torture, but thankfully it would have been over pretty quick. Number 1. The Blood Eagle the person was first brought to a ceremonial chopping block where they were laid on their stomach. The executioner then took a really sharp knife and cut through the man's back with so much pressure that he severed the rib cage. That's part one. The ribs were pulled through his back and were stretched out so they kind of looked like wings. But as they were very bony wings, then the man's lungs were stretched over them. Voila, an eagle, a bloody eagle. By this time, of course, the man was also dead as a dodo. It sounds too bad to be true, and the only evidence is in those old Viking legends. It's mentioned in something called the Orkneyinga Saga from the 13th century. In this story, a guy named Harold I Fairhair, the first king of Norway, goes up to the rugged islands of what's now northern Scotland, and he gives the locals a hard time, as the Vikings were apt to do. It was on the island of Orkney that Harold's son, Hafton Longleg, was executed because he'd taken out some Viking nobility. His death wasn't just about revenge, it was also about sacrificing Mr. Longleg to the god Odin. 
Here are some actual texts from the saga in translation. Earl Einar went up to Halfdan and cut the blood eagle on his back, in this fashion that he thrust his sword into his chest by the backbone and severed all the ribs down to the loins, and then pulled out the lungs, and that was Halfdan's death. Another case involved a formidable Viking warrior named Ivar the Boneless. Boneless, some historians say, wasn't related to a lack of courage or disability, but the fact that his John Thomas didn't always rise to the occasion. It's a long story, but do you remember the English king we talked about earlier, Ayala, of snake pit fame? Well, Mr. Boneless outsmarted the king and captured him. Only the very worst punishment would do, so they gave him the blood eagle. The text in the saga reads, And Ivar, the one who dwelt at York, had Ayala's back cut with a blood eagle. Were the Vikings making this up? Possibly. But they were a rough bunch from time to time, so we'll give them the benefit of a doubt. Now we need to watch the worst amusement park ride disasters, or have a look at this gruesome video, Why Escalator Accident is the Worst Way to Die.